in the rivers, lakes, and bayous of the American South live creatures that have been here since the dawn of time. Prehistoric looking aquatic monsters that remain steeped in mystery. A giant fish, the alligator gar, has been measured at eight and a half feet, but lengths of 10 feet or three meters have been reported. Just how big do they get? And are accounts of them attacking people true? Monsters, major predators in this water, and a lot of people don't even know they're even gar that big in these waters. You tell them, they don't want to ski here anymore. You've heard of a fisherman going out fishing, you know, and not coming back, not finding a body, you know, just poof, disappear. Wow, that is a fish. As a biologist, I travel the world through some of the toughest terrain, researching animals to better understand their behavior. Now, I'm on a mission to find the biggest and baddest creatures on the planet. I'm Niall McCann, and I'm here in Louisiana, searching for prehistoric monsters of the swamp. You don't need to look far to find formidable monsters in the Louisiana swamps. Alligators are everywhere. But less known giants, ancient fish and turtles, are also here, unchanged for over 50 million years. Since the 1930s, logging and construction of levees have reduced Louisiana's wetlands by more than 4,900 square kilometers, nearly half the size of Northern Ireland. Yet amazingly today, this prehistoric forest still guards secrets. So many of our myths of dangerous or scary animals are based around species that reside in swamps, either mythological species or, or real species. And a lot of the animals left here today are the types of animals that would have formed a lot of those myths that we hear about. And here in the USA, the Native American peoples told stories of strange prehistoric looking creatures, stories that the white settlers found to be true. So I've come here to Louisiana and with the help of local experts, I hope to find what is perhaps the most charismatic of all of these monsters of the swamp, an eight to 10 foot giant, the alligator gar. And images of the monster fish, the alligator gar, flood the internet, as does speculation that they might just eat people. I want to separate fact from fiction. My search begins in the northern part of the state, where tributaries of the massive Mississippi River feed the bayous and wetlands of this area, providing a rich habitat for fish and other aquatic creatures. Also, favorite fishing grounds of local families who have depended upon this resource for centuries. In fact, I'm meeting one guy who holds the state record for the largest alligator gar ever caught. Because that's pretty much my only way of catching these things. All of the people that live here in Louisiana, barely anyone knows that out there in the swamps live these prehistoric beasts, these alligator gar that reach enormous sizes. So the only way for me to get a big gar is to team up with the best fishermen in the whole state. That means state champ Brad Doughty and his fishing buddy, Sherman Foote. Coming with us? I don't think you're allowed, little man. All right, where are we off? Where are we headed? We're going to go down into the Ouachita River. We're going to go down about two miles. Uh, been seeing a lot of big gator gar there roll, so we're going to go down there and see what we can do. Great, let's roll. The bayous here really remind me of some of the jungles that I've lived in, like Honduras and the Amazon. It's amazing to find this ancient landscape here in America. We've just started out when we come across an alien looking life form. And do you know what this is? Are they eggs or what? No, it's, it's not eggs. That is actually an organism, kind of like, um, kind of similar to like a coral or, uh, but it's a jelly substance that it just keeps growing and growing. It's massively parasitizing this. There's huge ones down here. Okay. The size of that. It's ridiculous. I've never seen anything like this. What earth is that? That's 
one of the most bizarre things I've ever seen. It's just falling apart, look at that. What a crazy, crazy substance. Um, absolutely covered in some kind of slime. This tiny little nuclei here. So it's probably a combination of organisms which all come together. Each of these being a single cell. That's really bizarre. I've never seen anything like this. You, it's common around here. Yes, uh, you can find them uh, this time of year pretty much everywhere. Further research reveals these to be bryozoans, which literally means mossy animals. It's so bizarre. This is a unique colony of tiny creatures. They're related to jellyfish and primitive invertebrates. Big one down here. They're green because of the algae that grows around them, and it's this relationship which gives them their name. Finding life forms half a billion years old makes me wonder what other prehistoric creatures might be living in these waters. For now, I have my sight set on a giant alligator gar. When they hunt, is it normally right at the bottom or they come up to the surface to hunt? Uh, they, they mostly go on the shallows, yeah. right up to the, They try to get them as shallow as they can. That way they got, you know, control over them a little better. They're the apex predator. Apex. Anything they can grab a hold of, they'll eat. Given their size, it's no surprise when Sherman tells me he's seen a gar attacking and eating a raccoon who's crossing a river. Brad is leading the way to a spot where a massive alligator gar has been sighted over the years. She's way over 200 pounds. This, this, she's, she's, she could be a possible record if we can get her. She's really big. She looks about eight and a half to nine foot long, and anything that size is, could be 300 or better. Sherman is a commercial fisherman and licensed to lay out nets here to capture alligator gar and other fish. And go backwards and we just gotta make sure that it goes out without tangling like this. Um, shouldn't mean nothing to it. And this is where you said the huge female is? Yes, it was right over here. Um, had one one time, it rolled, so I was gonna try to catch it. So I get, went and got the nets, brought her in here. Well, when I brought the net in with this boat, she moved out and she would go out here and she'd flop, you know, she was mad. So, so she's splashing her tail splashing on the surface? Splashing her tail on the surface. She moved out here, uh, went over there to try to put the net out. Well, then she disappeared on me. So I said, well, I'm gonna come down here on my jet ski. It's a different boat, different sound. A little quieter. A little quieter. So I got my feet hanging in the water and wasn't there probably 15 minutes. Well, she rolls right behind the jet ski, just comes oh. up and gets her breath of air and just, just goes right on, right underneath the jet ski oh. and where my feet was hanging in the water. But you pulled them out very I, quick. I got on top of that jet ski right then because she was massive. She was this wide and she was probably less than 10 feet from me. Wow, and that was and just a warning, I suppose. Yes. Here I am. Here I am, I know what you're doing, Recognize old buddy. You. I know you, you, uh, you're you not supposed to be here. Wow. Since the 1800s, there have been numerous stories of alligator gar attacking people, most recently involving a young girl on Lake Pontchartrain near New Orleans. What I've heard, you know, this young girl was on the dock dangling her feet in the water. Something just grabbed a hold of her foot and she was kicking and screaming and she, she said she felt the fish jerking several times. She really didn't know what it was. And then when she come on the bank, there was these pencil-like gouges all in her heel and down her feet. And, you know, her, her parents had taken her to the doctor and, and, you know, they're like, no, this isn't what an alligator would do. We, we don't know what it was uh, and, and what they figure when they got to talking with biologists and everything that it, it had to be an alligator gar with the, the shape of the, the teeth marks through the feet. Over the next hour, we'll set the net and bait jug lines to try and capture, measure and release one of the big gar. But coming up, I get a surprise, face to face with one of America's deadliest snakes. I'm searching the waterways of Louisiana for a 50 million year old heavily armored fish with near impenetrable scales. These are very sharp. A, a lot of people think they're Native American arrowheads from the Indians. And you know, I tell them, no, this is a scale. This is their defense. This is why alligators and the alligator gar and the alligator snappers are the predators. Nothing, nothing penetrates this this scale. I mean, you can with, with an arrow from a bow fishing bow, but uh, anything else, not a chance. It's like, it's like a rock. Adapted for partial air breathing, 
No one really knows just how big they get. This photograph from the 1950s shows an amazing specimen said to be nearly 13 feet long. So we've got one of the most legendary fish on Earth living here exclusively in the southern United States, the alligator gar. It's legendary for lots of reasons. Obviously its appearance is just utterly insane. It looks like a cross between a prehistoric reptile and a fish. And they have these amazing mouths, these incredible amounts of teeth, and rumours, of course, of attacking people, whether or not they're true. Who am I to say at the moment? And what we're trying to do here is catch ourselves one of the gar using a huge net, 600 feet long. So we know it's here, we've heard it. As soon as we moved in, we could hear it splashing away at the surface, which is a sign that it's agitated. And the net's a great way to catch them. We've probably got only a few feet left. We're getting pretty close to so head into the shore. Right in. Perfect. Perfect. Great, so we're spread out right the way from here on this side of the swamp all the way to the other, blocking off that entire mouth. So anything passing between should hit our nets. It's hoping. While we wait for the gar to come around, Sherman shows me another favourite fishing spot. Once we get in here, it's probably how the river looked, you know, 200, 300 years ago, back. It used to be. Yeah, when the Indians basically here, yeah. Oh, this is stunning through here. This is what you think of when you think of the bayous. It's this kind of view here, fantastic. Wow. All these cypress roots. Good place for cottonmouth snakes, that's for sure. Some tracks going up there as well. Oh, it's pigs. Hogs been coming down here. Wow. Alligator gar are notoriously difficult to find. They're incredibly sensitive to intrusion in their environment. And if you come putting around in an outboard motor for a while, they're going to move away. So in order to actually try and find these guys, you have to be stealthy. You have to stake them out, find out what their patterns are, find out what their movements are, where they're staying, where they're feeding. And only then can you move in and actually attempt to, to corral some. So the fish will just sink down. Yeah, they'll sink down, um, gar come along, and grab one, hopefully. I'll just sit back and wait. But we need to go put some more of these out. Yeah, fantastic. You have to use the wire because they'll just rip straight through string, will they? Yeah, they'll cut string easy, and they can cut cable. They'll get it in their teeth and just keep gnawing on it. But the uh, baling wire, like this, is uh, just a regular wire. They really can't get a grip on it, so they didn't, they're not able to get their teeth in it. Have you ever found that in one's stomach? Uh, no, no, usually we catch them. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's the idea. Yeah, we, yeah, matter of fact, they have a, they say it's, it was a gar gutologist. He studies the insides of what they find that gar eat. Gar gutologist. Yeah, that's a <laughs> good category, isn't it? But they have found uh, stainless steel leaders. They found meters off diesel trucks, uh, chunks of log, grass, uh, rocks, small ducks. So they're just a trash can, they'll eat anything. Anything that moves. After a few hours, we head back and check the nets on the main river. But no alligator gar. Then, one of the jugs appears to be moving. That little tingle of excitement as you approach it. What's it going to be? What's it going to be? There we go. It's a catfish. It's a big catfish. It's an impressive looking beast, but it's not a giant alligator gar. Stick this guy back, and carry on on our hunt for a monster gar. There you go, little man. And straight down to the bottom where he belongs. Things turn wet as we head back to camp. We'll return later tonight to check the baited lines. I decide to investigate a few of the local stories about giant alligator gar. You've been fishing in the bayous of Louisiana for 
your whole life. What is it about the alligator gar that so terrifies you? Oh yes, it scares me to death. I mean, I've been on the river, watched all river since I was knee high to a bush. I started taking up slack skiing when I was eight and have been out there forever and had heard stories, you know, but I'm just going, oh, it's just a myth, you know, it's just not real, not true, because I wanted to ski so bad. Well, you know, I'm skiing behind a boat one day and I look up and I see another wake and it's not the boat and it's not my ski. And I look down, I see something just long, you know, silver, and I knew it was a fish because I could see the dorsal fin. And I just said to the bank, and I hadn't skied since. They're eating something, and they're out there a long, long time, you know. To be able to be that big, you know, it's almost like prehistoric, and, and they are survivors for sure. This wouldn't be the last fantastic tale I heard about alligator gar. Just down the road at the local tavern, I meet Jerry, who presents me with a formidable bent hook. He says was in the mouth of a massive alligator gar. It was almost eight foot long, which we were really impressed with that. Because yeah, we had never, in a freshwater lake, we'd never seen nothing that big as far as a fish. Alligators, yes. So do you think any of the stories attributed to alligator killing pets could actually be alligator gar? Oh, yes. Uh, there's no doubt. Spurred on by these stories, I head back for some night fishing and get an unexpected surprise. We've just come across a snake I have never seen and I've always wanted to see. It's a copperhead. It is absolutely beautiful. Look at that thing. Fantastic, now it knows I'm here. So this is one of the America's most famous snakes, named obviously because of the beautiful copper color on the back of its head. And it's, it's a pit viper, so it's got heat-seeking pits just in front of its eyes, which it uses to hunt. A bit of a visual predator as well. And it has pretty serious venom. You wouldn't want to get bitten by it, that's for sure. The copperhead is responsible for the largest number of snake bites in America each year, with thousands of injuries to people and pets. While not usually fatal, these bites can be very serious. So, I won't hold it for very long because I don't want to stress it out too much. There is a copperhead. Just an absolutely beautiful animal. Wonderful. One of America's most famous venomous snakes. One of the world's most famous venomous snakes. Partially because it's got a fabulous name. Partially because it's absolutely beautiful. And of course, principally, because it is very, very venomous. What a wonderful animal. Excellent. Right, I'll let it go. You guys all ready? Three, two, one. And off it goes. Camouflage. It isn't that beautiful. Yeah, look at the camouflage. Just incredible. Next, we check our baited lines and find ourselves face to face with a prehistoric giant. We're night fishing for a monster gar in Louisiana. My guide Sherman decides to pull out all the stops with a Mad Max style boat. Part outboard, part airboat, fitted with airport landing lights. This support boat, driven by his wife Melanie, illuminates our return trip to check the baited lines. Then, an unexpected hazard of the trip literally pops up. Yes, that was the invasive uh, species, the Asian jumping carp. Anything like boat motors trigger them, they stay near the top of the water at night and they just, they'll fly in the boat. We, we may end up catching one. So. Okay, we got one in. Whoop, there's another. These Asian jumping carp, these introduced fish, respond to any intrusion by a motor by leaping out of the water as fast as they can in the general direction of that sound. Which is bad news if you're screaming through the swamps at 40 miles an hour and you suddenly have a fish that weighs 10 to 20 pounds flying at your head. Yeah. Yeah. Approaching the big gar's location, we see that something might be on the line. 
We have something big on that. That's that's moving, isn't it? Go that way, buddy. That way. You hear me? That way. Think he listens? Off you go, my man. That is that moving. Way. You hear my boat running? I want you to go that way. You make a bit of just manhandle him right on over in. You can get him up and look at him. That is definitely a, a, a gar. Let that go. Wow. So that had some little power to it. That had some serious power. Hey, stay right here. Stay right here. See how he stops? He, he knows what we're trying to do. Yeah. Okay. We'll give him a few more minutes and try to tire him just a few more minutes. He's not going to go to the bank. We may have to uh, rope him. That big boat's gonna scare him back. Yeah, yeah he's turned around. They're so sensitive to every little sound. They, they, really they know are. exactly where we are in the water and where they want to go. Wow, that is a fish. That is a big animal. This is phenomenal. We've got just an enormous, enormous fish there. And these guys aren't even that impressed. Like, yeah, well, it's big, but it's not that big. It's huge by my standards. And it's just running that jug back and forth, trying to tire it out, get it towards the shore, and then we can have a proper look at it, get it in the boat. That is a beast. We'll get it in a boat. So we're going to need an extra pair of hands to try and shepherd the fish in towards the bank. So Brad's going to jump on in. Come on in, man. Right. We can't pull too tight, though, because we don't want it to rip out. It just coax him in. That's a big animal. That is a big animal. She's going the right way. We continue to try and steer her towards the bank. Oh, yes. She's down there. She's gone towards the bank, so she's going the right way. If we, if we can get her back over here. No, right there. We back up, back up, back up. She's tired. She's ready to come in the boat. Yeah, let's get her here and we can try to find her. No, it's okay, not. Well, just stay right there. We're going to try to bring her right here. That is incredible. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Wow. Look at that. Look at that. Look. And if something happens, she breaks loose. No big deal. We'll catch another one. Look at that. She broke loose. She broke loose. That was huge. Any alligator car that reaches six or seven or eight feet long has incredible survival skills. It's only reached that size by running the gauntlet of an enormous number of incredibly dangerous animals that could have eaten it at any point. That was incredible. What an animal when you saw it up close. So the very individuals that we are trying to catch are by far the hardest individuals out there in the swamp. Nope. It's not even really had a nibble. So we've been checking all the jugs to see whether any of the gar have latched on. That's two or three now that had nothing, so we'll keep on going, see whether we can find something. Let's hope that we see one moving around with a big alligator gar on the other end. Right, let's head back. but other gar remain elusive. So we pulled the whole net in and obviously no gar went running into that part of the swamp with two buffalo carp, but that was about it. But still, for the first night, I'd say we've had a serious success. That, that fish was huge that was on the jug. Racing back to beat a looming thunderstorm, we're reminded to never let down our guard. The more we speed up, the more dangerous it is with these jumping carp. I've had two miss my ear by a matter of inches. And we know this part is packed with them. There's one. Tomorrow we'll travel to one of Brad's other secret spots for Giant Gar. It's a place full of surprises and hidden dangers. This is a stop hole. Another morning in central Louisiana, and we just missed catching a giant prehistoric fish, the alligator gar. Time to regroup. 
Well, what she's done to this hook yesterday was, was incredible, because that's a tough old thing. Oh, I'd, yeah. I'd struggle to bend that with my fingers, but she's, she's bent that right back. Yeah, when she, when she got up close to the boat like that, and she brushed that boat, that's when she opened that mouth and just all that force. And it, and it didn't have her hook well, it, it wasn't deep enough into the, the throat tissue where it needed to be or in the jaw, so. Because it's right on the bone. It's yeah, all that is bone, head. just solid bone. I was amazed how big she was. The size of her head, is, it, it was really reminiscent for me of pulling a crocodile into the boat. That's all I could think of was, we, we've got it in the same way, we're playing it in the same way as we, we were playing the crocodile, and then here is an animal that looks like some kind of prehistoric reptile coming right to the surface there. I was just astonished. Time to hit the river again to locate the elusive giant fish. So we've loaded up and we're down at the waterside again to get out and try and catch a gar. We've got the fan boat that Brad will be riding, complete with a smashed bowl from one of those Asian jumping carp yesterday. It hit this, it was just an incredible explosion, wasn't it? Yeah. Just, the sound was insane. And we looked up and there was this carp shooting off in one direction and this was bent right back and it smashed the bulb. And then Sherman and I are going to be riding this small boat again. We'll get out there, we'll lay some jugs out and we'll see what we can hear any turning, maybe get a net round one, see what we can catch. Moving along the shoreline, I spot another unique inhabitant. This is one of the coolest things I've ever seen. It's a soft shell turtle. As you can see here, the shell is totally soft. You can see the rib cage all the way down there, extending to here. The reason this is particularly exciting to me is because it's a perfect example of what people call an intermediate species. So if you look at this, look how wobbly that is and all the blood vessels go all the way to the side of the shell. This is essentially halfway between a lizard and a turtle. It's a perfect example of evolution in action. What an amazing, amazing animal. And the guys were joking that the only thing that's hard about the soft shell turtle is its teeth and its attitude. Uh, those are big alligator gar, they, they like to come in here, they spawn back in here. It'll run into an open basin we call Shinny Basin, and it's full of like young buffalo and carp and, and their bottom feeder fish, uh, bait fish, and that's, that's what they love to eat. The biggest here was 170 pounds, and I've seen bigger, so that's what we're at today. We're after the monsters. I mean, there's some in here that go over 200 pounds. I just saw a big one rise right over there. Okay, well, let's, let's try and get the jugs out just right here and let them drift in. Hopefully we'll hear them coming up for air. Yes, yes, they should. Two hooks ready, and then the rest is going to be like four and five off hooks. Had the gar. Really like to hunt around the base of these cypress trees, around the base of these stumps as well. That's where all the bait fish hang out, and that's what the gar are really after. And we're simply trying to give them the type of bait fish that doesn't run away and hope that they'll fall for it. Waiting on a gator guard. That's your spot right there. You hear them exhaling and then they inhale again to refill their swim bladder, which is what keeps them at the right level of buoyancy. Right. It's not long yeah. before we start seeing jugs on the move. So, whoa, look at that go, look at that go. And something strong on the line. There. Oh, here it is. There we go. He's really coming out. Wow. Now that is an amazing fish. But as far as alligator gar goes, this is not a big one by any means. We know that the big females reach well, 10 feet, over 200, 300 pounds at the top. This is still incredible. And if we're able to have a look at those teeth, this is something else. If I lay it out here. Look at that. That is absolutely beautiful. Wow. Uh, look at that. Look at That'd those teeth. Really look at those teeth. Now, gar like this actually survive incredibly well out of the water. They're able to breathe air for a short amount of time, so this isn't too bad for it. They have these wonderful, wonderful scales, which shaped like arrowheads, and traditionally the 
Native American people who lived in these parts actually used them not only for jewelry and currency, but as weaponry. And then as agriculturalists took over in this part of the world, the skin was seen as such a useful tool. It was actually used to line people's plows for plowing furrows in the soil. So it's incredibly tough, incredibly sharp, and readily available in the bayous and swamps of Louisiana. It's just a wonderful, wonderful beast. And this head is absolutely something else. Pretty good for fish number one. Let's let it back. There you go, my dear. Down into the depths. Little out breath. Down it goes. That's a pretty amazing start. I'm just staggered at its features, at its general appearance, at everything about it. It's this incredibly prehistoric, primordial looking monster of the swamp, still living today in the 21st century. Just absolutely remarkable and a privilege to be able to see one. Great work, guys. Really great work. Great work. Right, let's go check this net. With one less savvy juvenile caught, next we spot a huge gar rolling on the surface near our net. I think she tore through. I really did. Wow, is that the hole? We turned around as we saw the surface of the water start to boil, and then this absolutely monstrous beast came out of the water as we heard the net pop. But this net is designed to withhold an immense amount of strain. And we've just found a big hole down here that she has just ripped clean through. What we do find in the net is this amazing wow. paddlefish. As ancient as the alligator gar and reaching similar sizes. Incredible, incredible beast. Superb. Don't go back in the net. Off you go. Wow, look at that. Go on, off you go. Off you go. Good on you. That's it. Go in the right hand. Finally, I check the jug lines, and something's been eating our bait. If it's one of the big gar, it's being very crafty indeed. No, nothing. That was obviously a big one as well. Huh? That was a big one. It's a really yeah. big hook, so... Leave that where it is. Whoever it was, they robbed us, and now we're down a few traps. What it is, the gar, us being in here, they know we're here, they're getting agitated. You can tell because they're in the middle of the bayou rolling now. And what it is, we either want to get out of here and leave them alone, or we can come back in the morning. It's night by the time we haul up the net and we scour the water and shoreline in the fan boat, for signs of big fish rolling or any other wildlife in the area. But we didn't count on submerged stumps and getting stuck on a sunken log. We tried jostling it loose. Yeah. This is a stump hole. Just as we get free, we spot okay, a nighttime it's a visitor. It's a, type of it's a type of heron. It's a juvenile black crowned night heron. Striated. It's amazing that it's so dazzled by the light that we can walk right up to it like this with two meters away from it. And they'll come out at night only, really, and they'll sit here in the shallows and wait for all these little minnows to pass, and they'll just be picking them off one by one by one, and they'll have a feast for the whole evening. Big, big eyes, great for light gathering. So it obviously works in low light conditions like we have now at night, just looking for any kind of movement on the surface, and then pow. It's been an impressive day out in Louisiana's wetlands. That's got something on it. That's heavy. We're about to have face-to-face -face encounters with other monsters of the swamps. It's bright and early in the morning. The sun is only just up. We've come back down to the river here in the bayous of Louisiana. Here, everything's quiet. Everything is primordial, primeval and pristine in a way that you kind of imagine the United States used to be hundreds, if not thousands of years ago. We've been catching gar for the last few days, which by my standards have been huge. They've been enormous, but not by the standards of anyone else here. And something we've been noticing, when the water's been still enough, when the wind has got down, you see these huge gar rolling. They just break the surface, they come around, they roll over, they gulp air because they're filling their swim bladders. And you can see that they're huge. They're these enormous great things. But they seem to be 
According to the locals, according to Brad, according to Sherman, they're spotting us, they're watching for our patterns and they're avoiding us on purpose. This is a top predator and they live to 70, 80 or more years old. They must learn about their environments. They must learn what it takes to survive, what it takes to thrive in these environments. So I'm hoping to prove them right. I'm hoping that the traps we've set are gonna prove all the local people right, that these rumors of enormous animals, these giant monster gars living here in the swamps of Louisiana, aren't just rumors. Yeah, a bit of a On the way to check the baited lines, we spot a small island which I want to investigate. Check this out, check this out. Yes! Look at that! That is one of the most amazing animals I've ever seen. The alligator snapping turtle. That is a dinosaur. Look at those claws. Such power. Ooh, he's having a look around to try and get me. You do not want to get your hand in there. So they're ambush predators, much like the alligator gar. They sit right here on the water's edge, just underneath the water. And they've got this little worm-shaped tongue, which acts as a lure for fish. If something goes past, bang, with incredible speed, they snap it. these turtles can exceed 100 kilos or 200 pounds in weight. More than a match for anything in these waters. I find it pretty hard to contain my excitement at times like this. That's one of the things I've most wanted to see my entire life. And I'm tingling. That is wonderful. There you go, my man. Thank you very much. Oh, look at that. Look at him power away. That is fantastic. We resume checking the jugs for signs of big gar. That's got something on it. Oh, yeah. That's heavy. That is big. That is heavy. That really is heavy. Is it? No, no, no. What was that? No. Oh. Maybe that was just snagged. That was he Whatever that was, that was heavy. Yep, snagged. Oh well. Fish one, people nil. <laughs> if more jug lines show up empty, we'll definitely need more bait fish from this small net we set up earlier. We've got absolutely loads of bait fish, which we need to replenish our supplies on the, on the jugs to catch the gar. But most amazingly, we've also got this absolutely enormous paddlefish which got stuck in the net there we need to release this straight away huge great thing amazing amazing animal now they are persecuted here there you go off you go they're persecuted here for their caviar second only in quality to that of a sturgeon apparently off you go down it goes we continue to check the remaining jug lines. Again, the gar have been stealing the bait overnight or the other fishes. Um, this one moving? Yeah, I think that one moving. It could have been on for hours, so it might be quite tired by now, but let's see. Could have been on for seconds, yeah. I don't know. It's often quite hard to tell because the wind makes them move, but then if one seems to make a concerted effort to go in one direction, it tends to be a good indicator. I think this one is. Yeah, that was good. Whoa, 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 whoa. Yep, definitely. Definitely. Oh, down it goes, down it goes. This time, it looks like we do have a that monster on the line. Oh, that is heavy. Tired, I think, so. We're in Louisiana's bayous, chasing what could be a huge prehistoric fish on our line. Wow. If it goes under, it's definitely a monster. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Look at it bubbling right there. Oh, oh she's gone. She's, oh. Whoa. 
That is heavy. Oh, that is heavy. Just let her go. Let her go. Let her go. She... Yep, there she goes. All right, make a circle. Which way? Oh, back around. She's gone around. down again. She's gone under. Just go back under. You don't oh, want to grab her. Down. Oh, there she goes. That's got to be a huge fish. You got to put her uh, around I'll, the jug. I'll, I'll do that in a minute. We'll try and. Oh, right, she's gone. She'll be up in a bit. Oh, there, oh, there she is. Careful. Oh, Easy her on. Easy, yeah, Easy does it. Yeah, she just let her go. Yeah. She wants to go now. No, she's okay. She's okay. Uh, no, no, she, no, she went underneath the yep. boat. She come up on this side, I think. No, nope, she's in front of the boat. Yeah, she is. She is. She's going away from us. Oh. We need to get her on. There she goes. That is heavy. Whoa, whoa. That felt really heavy. Which is which is good to start to get excited about this. We finally get control of the big gun. Okay, take her in. Right up there, it's shallow. A little bit of work with her on the bank. Get her on the bank good. This is enormous. Huge. She'll be basically in control with the Yeah. The noose. It's like a puppy dog on a string. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of a more like a pit bull. Yeah, Some no, weird looking puppy dog. <laughs> more like an eight foot pit bull or something ridiculous. We got Watch you, bro. Uh, Watch her. And, and. Oh, oh, oh. Keep, keep the noose on. Uh -oh. Oh. Yeah, just. Yeah, hold it. Okay, and the loose is off, so we, we definitely don't want to. We want to make sure she's loose. pointed toward the bank at all times so she'll run. Let's take her in. She is huge. Lift her head up. Lift her up. Yeah, lift yeah. her head up. Make her go on the back. That. Wow! Look at that. That is insane. What an animal. Feel, feel the power of that thing. What do you reckon? That's about six feet long. It's as long oh, as yeah. I am. Oh, yeah. This is so bony. It's an absolute solid bone there. Prehistoric in appearance from the top. Let's see the. Yeah, the directions of the scales. The scales go this way so if, if you were to try to shoot it with a bow your arrow would hit and just you'd see sp actually sparks because I've, I've done this before see sparks and the arrow just shoot 10 foot up in the air wow. you have to get behind where these scales they they open up back here when a gar he'll flare up and these scales will, will open up so you never want to shoot if you're going to bow fish for gar you never want to try to take the gar coming dead at you that's why you don't get a whole lot of chances to get a big fish like this because they've got to be perfect going away from you, a little angled so you can get the penetration to get so, up so in this because this is armor. It's essentially just an armored animal. Yeah. Well, she's got something living inside her mouth. As ever, these poor things are parasitized up to the max. Wow, you can look at the intricacy on all of these interlocking plates on a, all these scales. That is just built for hunting. They sit and wait predators, they sit in the shallows, waiting for something to come past them, and anything that gets near that mouth is just a goner. Look at all of the teeth, they're actually barbed. Wow. While most fish would be gasping this long out of the water, the ancient gar have a unique ability to take in air and survive for long periods in low or oxygen depleted water. They also take in air to fill their swim bladder. And while this gar might sound like she has something to say, she's releasing air from her flotation system. We've been working at this for the last three days now. And of course, on day one, we had the fish battle and fight for 20 minutes and then come off the line. So that's, wow, that's much bigger than I thought. That's six foot 11 just under seven feet, six foot 11 and a half. So two meters, 12 centimeters. That's huge. That's wide, Absolutely yeah. huge. It's like, it's a dinosaur living here in the swamps of Louisiana. So many of the features are reminiscent of an ichthyosaurus. Look at that skull from the top. You could imagine it being a dinosaur living in the swamps here hundreds of millions of years ago. And, Garfish are part of the ray finned fish, which were a really early branch off in the evolution of fish. This is a very primitive species. 
that is 35 inches, 89 centimeters. So two, just under three feet, just over two foot 11 around. Three, two, one. Awesome. Yeah, Allowing for some wobbling on my part, yep. this fish comes in at 160 pounds or 73 kilos. At seven feet or 2.1 meters long, this is a good sized gar for the area. Time to let her go. This ancient fish is now a threatened species. Protection measures are being put in place in several states to limit commercial and sport fishing. There you go. I came to Louisiana in search of monsters of the swamp, alligator snapping turtles, and huge alligator gar. Now, each of these species has a fearsome reputation, some combination of both myth and reality. But when I looked a little deeper, what I discovered wasn't a swamp full of dangerous animals out to get you, but more a primeval habitat of prehistoric species, threatened by over-harvesting. And it's my conclusion that these monsters of the swamp, though they may be monsters, are really monsters in our own minds. Reptiles have invaded the state of Florida. Beginning in the Everglades in the 1990s, huge exotic snakes are slithering across farms and into suburbs and people's homes. Pythons are showing up on porches, in basements and in garages. Today, as many as 180,000 pythons could be roaming the state. They're eating their way through local wildlife and have even killed family pets. The largest caught so far, an 18 foot, five and a half meter long Burmese python made worldwide news in 2013. He's fucking getting loose. First thing I did, open his mouth, did just grabbed him by the neck, tried to pull him out this way. He wasn't coming out. And so I basically just sat on him, started wrapping around me within less than a minute. The spread of it, to stop it, I don't see that happening. 200 miles west of here, there's already big pythons, big pythons being caught over there in Naples already. Big pythons. You can see her right there. Yeah, she's bigger than six feet. This is a decent sized animal. Here she comes. Look at that. As a biologist, I travel the world through some of the toughest terrain, researching animals to better understand their behavior. Now I'm on a mission to find the biggest and baddest creatures on the planet. Oh, whoa. I'm Niall McCann, and I'm here in the Florida Everglades searching for invasive Burmese pythons. Sensational reports of Florida's invading pythons have made headlines around the world since the 1990s. Growing over six meters or 20 feet in length, Burmese pythons are at the top of the food chain. Non-venomous, they can crush and devour anything that comes their way, from a small rodent to an alligator or human. Whoa. Lately, authorities have noticed a major decline in local wildlife. And when this image of a 76 pound deer inside a python's belly hit the press, it got the public's attention. Threat to humans hit even closer to home when an African rock python killed a 60 pound husky in the Miami suburbs. Could people be next on the menu? The history of the world tells a story of the destruction of native species by those species that we have introduced. One of the most devastating examples of that is happening here in Florida, where Burmese pythons, a formidable predator growing to over 18 feet in length and native to Asia, are eating their way through Florida's native wildlife. So I've traveled to the Everglades to investigate the true scale of this invasion, the Florida Python epidemic. The Everglades region is the largest subtropical wilderness in America and covers an area of 730 square miles or 1900 square kilometers in Southern Florida. And for many living near the Everglades, Python sightings and encounters are becoming more frequent. While Burmese are the most common, I want to get a look at one of the latest invaders, the very aggressive African rock python. 
I've come to herpetologist Joe Wozolewski's reptile compound, which is housing a large, recently caught rock python. Joe always tackles this bad boy with some trepidation. Yeah, this is a supercharged uh, python. It's nothing like a Burmese python, as you'll see. Um, how do you tend to do this? When I capture this animal, which is seldom, I like to use the element of surprise. Do you want to actually get it behind the head and actually pull her out properly? Yes, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I'm going to flip it this way, and we'll just hope for the best. Oh, you got it right. The element of surprise. Good job. There we go. I didn't want to waste any time with this animal because we know what they are like. Yes, right? yeah, yeah. It's a decent sized beast, 11 feet or no. so, and it's powerful. I can certainly yeah. feel its power. Here, let me just kind of. Uh, there you go. Ready? Your hook. Yeah, yeah. There we go. Boom, straight away. Whoa! It's immediately having a go. Here, I'll hold it. That is, that's a long, that's about two meter strike range. Well, there and thereabouts. And high, coming up at the chest. It's quite something. Just watch how fast that goes. Off it goes. Grab him. Come on. Back you come. All right, you're going to grab him? Because I'm now. Oh, we could, well, I have to put it back in, don't we? <laughs> yes. Right. I'll hold it by the tail. Whoa. It's just. Here, I'll straight. hold the tail. I got it now. Let's put it back. Okay. Uh, I had it, and then it, then it turned to face me. That is a serious strike range. Okay, now. There you go. All right. All right, let's just put him back. You ready? Yeah. There we go. Woo! High five. It'll wear you out, won't it? That certainly will. And it, that has not lost any energy in the last no, little while. No, no, no. Burmese would calm down. That was mm -hmm. not calming down. Not it was at still all. going. So now you see the difference between a Burmese and a rock python. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Excellent. Any python this close to human settlement is going to be a problem. And if you're face to face with one in the Miami Dade area, you better call Ruben Ramirez and George Branner, <laughs> the Florida python hunters. This kind of place is just perfect for pythons to hide out in during the day. Well, we got wet for nothing. For the next week, I'll be searching alongside these guys who are licensed by the state to capture pythons and other invasive species, then deliver them to the authorities for euthanizing. They call it herping, and they don't get paid to do it. Herping is the scientific name for like snake hunting, but when you say snake hunting, it sounds like you're hunting, like killing. So you're herping is like catching snakes. The purpose of the Florida Python Hunters was to unite everyone together to focus on the same you know, objective, which is to save the ecosystem here in Everglades. If this truly is an invasion, I want to see how many pythons we can catch and measure over the next few days. We begin looking for snakes in the deep hedgerows that line the highways. We're looking for places where the pythons might be resting up and a fence line like this is a great feature because a big python simply won't be able to go through a fence with a mesh that big. So they'll get up against it, and then they'll move down, and they'll be blocked by it, and that's a great place for us to start looking. You have to be a little bit wary of venomous snakes as well, so we're wearing almost knee-high snake boots, which if we do get hit, going to have to hit us a very long way up the leg. This is the perfect type of thing we're looking for. See where a big snake or something has been sitting down here. Now we've been checking a load of these little grassy verges and this one is by far the most promising so far. This yeah. one has been full of a potential python sign. You come across many just by stepping on them. Yeah, you, you tend to yeah, spot. Yeah, you can step on. Whoa, whoa, snake, snake, snake. Where? There. Where? It's a baby. Baby corn snake. Snake number one. <laughs> I just said this is the perfect thing we're looking for. This wasn't entirely what I had in mind. Gorgeous little thing. Native species. Actually really good at keeping down the local rodent populations when they get a little bit larger. Gotta let them go, that's native. 
Beautiful. Let the native species go. Down you go. That's a native species. That's the type that we want to be here. It's the invasive pythons, the Burmese pythons, the African rock pythons, and now the carpet pythons from Australia that we're trying to find and trying to take out. Yeah. Uh, this is a good place for them to go crossing the yeah. road as well. Yeah, they, they cross here. Every night they cross here. Next, a farmer calls in about a python raiding his chickens. And night hunting proves to be a humid, bug-infested hike, where I keep one eye out for venomous snakes and the other for our prey, the invasive Burmese python. Here she comes. Here she comes. All scary I'm working with the Florida python hunters in the Everglades to capture and remove invasive pythons and get an idea of the scale of the epidemic. If we understand the pythons' movements, if we understand what they're eating, if we understand everything we can about their biology, then we have much more of a chance of controlling the invasion. By early 2013, the state of Florida had become so concerned with the growing python population, they held the Python Challenge, a contest with a prize for the greatest number of pythons caught. They came to hunt Burmese pythons in the Everglades. Officials asking ordinary citizens to help find and kill an invasive species that's decimating wildlife. The Python Hunt Challenge, there was like 1,600 contestants that came here from all over the U.S. I mean, everybody thought they were going to just be walking and stumbling across them. The biggest problem facing those who want to eradicate the Burmese python is the sheer vastness of the region. More than half of the people who signed up just gave up. It takes a lot more than just coming out here, walking around and seeing a python. You need to really, really know what you're going to focus and look for them and put the time into the field. Reuben and George won the challenge, catching nearly one third of the 68 pythons caught by the 1,600 contestants. This morning, the python hunters got a call from a local farmer who's had a series of disturbing python encounters. Now, this is the gentleman here, the farmer who has been running up against pythons. How are you doing? Come on, Ray. How are you? How are you? Has encountered a lot of pythons here. I've killed him. The big one, too? The big one. How did you kill him? Ah, the big one. He's far away. He's far away. So he's killed three by shooting them from a great distance. Dear, dear. He's had several chickens killed by pythons, and he'd like us to return tonight to see if there are any big snakes coming back for seconds. About 10 days ago, they saw a big one over there, about a 15-footer. The farm is next to a cluttered machine depot, and the combination of tasty animals and plenty of snake hiding spots makes this a python paradise. Inside the cow pasture, there's uh, mounds of rocks, stuff where they like to refuge, and then from there they go into the chicken coops. It's a perfect place though for a nice python to be. Yeah. yeah it'd be a good way of telling whether there's python around when all the animals go nuts. There we go. Nice. We can just climb over this one inside. In terms of animal welfare, this is fantastic because we've got really nice free-range area for the chickens they can just come and go as they please and for the pythons this is just well it's just a beacon this makes just a perfect environment for the pythons i mean they can just come in here feed at night and then out they go back into their burrows out all around these fields and these areas pythons have returned here night after night and we know they could be lurking anywhere that's where he found the python. He came, the landowner came. The python was coiled up right in this corner right here with the chicken in it. Climb back out of this one. No snakes here tonight. But across Florida, pythons find the smell of caged birds irresistible. Chicken coops lure pythons in bringing them into close contact with bigger farm animals, pets, and humans. The big snake's hunting instinct takes over, and there's no stopping him. Back at the farm, 
I find another kind of invasive predator, originally brought over to control insects in sugarcane fields. Just come across what is one of the most infamous invasive species anywhere in the world. It's a cane toad. They're an absolute disaster for two main reasons. Firstly, they're voracious predators themselves. They eat eggs, they eat anything they can get their teeth on, basically. And secondly, they're highly toxic. These glands on the back of its head exude a nasty toxin, which is fatal to most species that ingest it. So they have no natural predators. There's almost no way of actually killing them in the wild. These guys are hell on earth. With no snakes at the farm, we head out to an Everglades highway, a python hotbed. The daytime temperatures here in Florida, even at this time of year, in the fall, the autumn, are still exceedingly high. And the pythons just lie up in the shade, or down a hole, somewhere hidden. And it's at night time when they come out to go hunt. We're heading off now to find an area of road where they cross between two parts of the Everglades National Park, which are apparently infested with pythons. What's the biggest, biggest snake you get around here would be a rattlesnake, naturally. Yeah. So totally naive population. Nothing, of of, nothing native here knows what a python is. Since getting out of the truck, I've seen two rats already. This place is just full of food. Catching a python here is not easy. We're looking for just a tail sticking out. If we make a wrong move, the snake has an easy escape into the canal. Where we're walking now is perfect hunting ground for the pythons. Exactly, so they come up to the, this ridge here and they do their hunt and then from here they just go back into the water, back into, see this Everglades sawgrass? Yeah. I mean, that's where they go back into. Then we spot something. You can see her right there. Yeah, she's bigger than six feet. This is a decent sized animal. Here she comes. Here she comes. Look at that. Fantastic. Big Burmese python. Bring a snap of the shoes. Wow. Beautiful nice beast. Person. Look at the size of her. Seven feet or so, almost? Yeah. First night, not bad going. There we go. Oops, she's just got some little bits of soil. What a beautiful, beautiful beast. That is spectacular. As you and I were talking about, it's a really bittersweet moment, isn't it, this? It is a bittersweet moment. Unfortunately, it has to get put down, euthanized. Now, the disaster is, in many cases, species that are invasive in one place are actually rare in their homeland. Exactly. And the Burmese python is a threatened species in back Asia. in Asia. Yeah, yeah, so Unfortunately, I... just <laughs> disastrous for the native species here in the United States. Okay, right now what I got to do on this python here is get the exact time, date, uh, and uh, longitude and latitude where it was captured. Uh, from there Snakes are measured and GPS coordinates are taken for the official records. Mm -hmm. West. 80. 80. 0.765. So where does the information that you collect get sent? I got to report it to uh, FWC. So give them Florida all the data. Wildlife Commission. Yes. For their studies and uh, do their uh, stomach content and see how they're affecting the ecosystem. Well, she's shy two inches or seven feet. Sadly, these snakes will be euthanized at a local university. What's the protocol? The protocol for this now, for the transport of the python, has got to be double bagged. It's got to put in a, in a container uh, with uh, double locks. And it's got to be the box, it's got to be labeled uh, dangerous reptiles. Here we are, here we are, here we are. No sooner do we have one in the bag when I come across a second python. That's a nice I can one. See, right it's, there. A, it's a male as well. The last one was a female. There we go. Measurements are taken on this eight-foot specimen, then it's bagged for the night. Two Burmese pythons caught just minutes apart. This is an invasion. Next, I hit the Everglades to scout the levees for big snakes hunting mammals. 
and we get a 911 call from a farmer who needs us to capture a python. Uh, it's a python. Just, just in case. I'm in Florida's Everglades, looking into the invasive python epidemic now spilling out into surrounding farms and suburbs. It's dawn, and we had our first python capture yesterday, which was which was great. And it was a decent size, it's just under seven feet, which by any normal snake standards is an enormous snake. But obviously by the standards of your big constrictors, that's not huge. What we're seeing here is that there's a large number of two, three, four, five year old pythons in the six to 10 feet range. And that's probably because after the major cold spell, 2010, which killed off a lot of the pythons, these are the only ones that are now coming back. So those that survived, gave birth, and the, it's their progeny that we're now seeing. But are there still monster-sized snakes out there? I'm heading out with Bob, a local guide into the heart of the Everglades, to see where some of these bigger snakes may still be thriving. scouting around the Everglades looking for a spot where the pythons might possibly be residing and basically it's all marsh it's all swamp but there are a few levees which have been built to rise up above the swamps they provide a bit of a refuge of dry land with the area scouted out my plan is to return here late tonight when things cool down and the pythons come out to hunt back at base camp Airboat guide Bob Freer shows me a python specimen he collected a few years ago. According to the media, the biggest python ever caught in the Florida Everglades was 18 feet and 7 inches long. According to Bob Freer, the biggest python was 23 feet long, caught in the early 90s. And on the evidence of this, I think Bob was right. It's just after sunset, and I'm heading back to the levee to search for signs of small mammals and pythons. We've got this mile stretch of levee, so if the snakes are taking refuge anywhere, it's likely to be up here. I think we need to spread out as much as we possibly yeah. can. We're going to have George walk down this side here. Because they could be coming out of the canals there. Out or of out the, the canal the or at that side coming up here, yeah. How far is it down the levee? About a mile. Great, OK, so we'll be able to thoroughly, thoroughly search that. Brilliant. It's just a corn snake. <laughs> oh, yeah, fantastic. Well, I've smelled snake twice so far. A really distinctive smell in both cases. And one of them I found, found a little corn snake similar to the other one I found, just a tiny little thing. So I guess that was what was giving off the smell, but maybe not. Maybe a python had been there and had had a tussle and had killed something. When I was a kid, I used to come out here. I mean, there was corn snakes all over the place. You see how it is now? No, you don't see. There's nothing. I mean, you got. We haven't seen any kind of mammals. No rats. No raccoons. No possums. We haven't seen anything. So you think the pythons are now moving out into suburbia more and into the agricultural lands more because that's where the food is. Yeah, they have got agriculture. They got that's where the rats go to eat. We take a last look around for pythons at the end of the levee. This stretch of water is known to have alligators in it. We watch our step. When I was a schoolboy in Australia, one of my brother's classmates got grabbed on the side of her head by a carpet python which had lent off the garage. So pythons definitely do see people as viable food. Then Reuben spots something. I got something crawling on my head. It's a praying mantis. Excellent. You see? Yeah, look at that. <laughs> there is life here, after all. Who said the Everglades were empty of wildlife? Look at this. <laughs> Fantastic. I love mantises. They're really cool. Where are you? Where are you? There you are. Come on. Come on. Fantastic. Look at that. 
So one of the most interesting things about mantises is they, if you go back through the fossil record, they evolved flight, they lost it, they evolved really? it again. So it's really, really crazy. I love how they bob. The only other thing that does that really frequently is like a, an eagle, the way eagles do that. Yeah. Right, and they check stuff out, the mantis is doing the same. There you go, little guy. It's surprising to find such little life in these rich wetlands. Unbelievably, studies by the state confirm the pythons have reduced some small mammal populations by 99% in southern Florida. On our way back, an unexpected stop. Our airboat smashes into solid ground, launching us into a canal. Gonna take some muscle to get it off the bank. We're clear. Back on dry land, the python hunt continues. When Reuben gets an unexpected call. I think I got something for you. I got a little snake for you here, man. What what was the coloration of it? I think it's a uh, it's a python. Alright, we're on our way. Now? Yeah. yeah, we're on our way right now. I love the fact that the guys are on a speed dial to go and respond to any snake emergencies in the area. It's great that people are doing that as opposed to just killing anything they see there. Calling up the experts and asking the experts to deal with it. It's a good step in the right direction. So you've got the snake in a bucket? Yeah, I saw the snake under the uh, golf cart and she moved over and coiled up and I put a bucket on top of it. And that's when I called you guys. My son is uh, anxious, uh, awaiting. Uh, Have you seen the snake yet? No, he hasn't. You seen haven't it seen yet. it. You're no, looking no, forward no, to no. seeing it. Yeah. I've got a snake hook on me if we need it. You have? Okay. Yeah, I got a hook. Just in case. That is a python. You yeah. never know what you're going to get on one of these calls. It's good to be prepared for any size reptile. Yeah, watch out with that one. Man. Yeah. So it's probably about five or six feet long, actually. It's a perfect example. We've got a snake coming into a farm area because you've got a lot of frogs, as you were saying. Yep. Presumably a lot of rodents may be attracted to this area too. It's not in great shape. It's, it's okay, but it's not, it's, not, it's not full. And I think that's been a bit of a trend of the ones that, that we've been seeing. They haven't been really, really well fed. There's probably so many snakes out there that they're starting to eat themselves out of the natural habitat. Yeah, and exactly. they're now being forced onto people's territory to find find food. We're not seeing many mammals, are we? We're not seeing, oh, yes. not seeing many rats or mice or the types of things that used to be really abundant here seem to be declining. Do you want to come and touch it? Do you want to touch it? Yeah, you should. You sure? Because I've, I've got the head so it's totally safe. And then really, really nice and smooth. Go ahead, touch it. Really soft. Okay, son. I'll just touch the, he touch the head, just, just by my thumb. There we go. Look at that. Oh, you saw the tongue come off. So it uses that to taste figure out where its food is and what's around, they, they taste the air. I want people to know these pythons are not evil, but are adapting as best they can to the new environment they've been thrown into. The work Reuben and his team are doing is vital, not just removing a threat, but also improving the reptile's image. See that? <laughs> How does that feel? So you guys have got all the information you need. You yeah. take it right now. One happy customer and an invasive python in the bag we're off on another investigation when a python shows up in the least likely place. I'm nearing the end of my fifth day in Florida, now scanning along the canals bordering the highways. When I get an unexpected python encounter at a service station. Here it is. So it's 10 past 11 at night. These guys spotted the Florida Python Hunters logo emblazoned on the back of their truck. So in here, Burmese python. Like, so how, how did you come across this? Were you looking for it or? No, we were coming down a dirt road and it was laid right in the middle of the road. And uh, we just reached out and grabbed it and threw it in a cooler and trying to figure out what we're gonna do with it. Have you decided what to do with it yet? Yeah, y'all are taking it. <laughs> <laughs> do you want to get it back out again? And then, yeah, then, then, then we'll measure it. Oh, I, was gonna, I was gonna say it's 
really nice and calm, and then it suddenly went mental. <laughs> so, it's yeah, it's big. Right, so, here on the floor of the gas station, let's measure it up. We got that in. There we go. Two inches shy of eight foot. Yeah. I thought it was big when Seven I saw it. Seven feet ten. Seven feet ten inches. That's a decent size. Well, we go out hunting in the big cypress. We haven't been seeing any any type of rodents lately. And you used to see a lot more of those. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's getting very bad out there. The decline in mammals has really coincided with the rise in, yeah. in python numbers. Even more evidence of the big snake seriously like impacting the mammal population. I'm done for the night, but I've arranged to meet another man who actually quit his job to hunt invasive species every day. I'm visiting a friend of Ruben's, who's made a full-time job of catching feisty Argentinian lizards, the tegus. Measuring up to four and a half feet, or 1.4 meters, tegus are gobbling up the eggs of Florida's birds and reptiles, like the endangered American crocodile. How does a man get into tegu catching? I'm a private yacht captain. I do demolition work, and I busted up my shoulder in such a way that uh, I couldn't do those uh, activities anymore. And I looked into the tegu problem here in South Florida and said, well, I can catch tegus. It's just a matter of, uh, it's kind of a learning process. I'm seven days a week finding tegus. It's turned into a 70, 80 hour a week job. As we go this way, the, uh, the size gets smaller. It's not just checking the traps, it's building the traps, building the enclosures, feeding 280 tegus of different sizes. Rodney gives me a tour of his tegu operation. He's selling these invasive reptiles to clients in Asia, both as food and as pets. Ah, you little prick, you got me. Now in the morning, you know, they're a little slower, but this time of day, they'll be laying around like, like that and because of the temperatures, they're ready to go right now. Just touch them and they're spring-loaded. God, oh, really has taken a chunk out of you. That was a quick bite. He bit and released. Sometimes, that big one that got me on the arm, he bit and hang, hung on like an alligator. And every time I'd move, he would go for a better grip like an alligator does. <clears throat> I've got one hand here holding him and he's clumped onto the other arm. I'm thinking, how am I gonna get him off? But, it's the back feet. Oh wow, it's able to bend yeah, right around. I'm talking about. So it's trying to bend all yeah, the way See, alligator can't do that. Yeah. And they are just incredibly quick. Feeding on the young of other animals, um, most of the time they won't even see the tegu coming. It, it'll happen so fast. And they've got sharp claws on the back Very feet as well. Sharp claws. Front are smaller, but these ones are big okay. on the back. Here we go. I'm going to hand them to you. This, this grip here, and yeah. then at the base of the tail. Anything goes south, just let go. And down here. Okay, and just apply pressure if it starts getting squirrely. This is kind of a different story. There was a, a large breeding operation, breeding tegus for the pet trade. And about 12 years ago, he released his animals into the wild. On purpose? On purpose. When that occurred, uh, they had the absolute best habitat that you could ever imagine for a tegu. And they've discovered that, yeah, they can do real well here. This is basically uh, continue what they were doing originally in, in Argentina. So we're checking all of Rodney's tegu traps. This is trap number one. Yep, traps down. That's always a good sign. Oh, let's check us out. Get him up. I think uh, I could probably bare hand this little guy. They can reach around incredibly far. It's not so bad with a little one, but when you get a big one, it reaches that far back. Okay. Reset the trap? Yep. Multitasking. Okay, little guy. Trap is reset. We're going to be turning around, heading back that way, check the next trap. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. the size of that. This one's all yours. I'd suggest two gloves on this guy. It's a really big one. Two gloves. 
I'd suggest just pull the whole trap up. So is it that way? Yep. And you can and be ready because he's going to try to spin. Look at that. It's a head full. All right, you got it. Just hang on to the head. Good grip. There we go, I got it. At this point, you own him. Now he's going to try to spin. Okay, that is a strong animal. Yes, they are. Now he can't spin. A bit different from a crocodilian. Okay, that let me open the seriously trunk. Seriously just... strong. I feel that Rodney's doing an amazing service here. It's not just a commercial venture, although that's obviously a positive aside, but this is one of the most devastating invasive species we have here in America. And to be removing them at the rate that Rodney's removing them is doing wonders for the wildlife of the Everglades and hopefully will go some way to preventing the extinction of critical and iconic species such as the American crocodile. Let's bag him up. It's getting screwed. Yeah. There we go, I got him now. Okay. Go. Good to go. Done. Nice work. Despite Rodney and Ruben's efforts, Tegu numbers, like Python numbers, just keep rising. Tomorrow, I'll follow up on some stories of a giant python eating livestock near a restaurant and pursue tales of snakes and escaped monkeys on a very mysterious island. Look at that. Fantastic big Burmese python. Working alongside the Florida python hunters, I'm now searching for the invasive snakes next to irrigated fields. This kind of time in the morning is the perfect time to find any snakes that are wanting to warm up. I'm going to be coming to the east bank to catch some morning sun. This is the best place to look. As the sun warms things up, start walking from here. Pythons crawl into the coolest places they can find to maintain their body temperature. I see pythons here all the time uh, when they're passing the you know the grader yeah. to the to the fields. It's like a little island. It's like a little refuge. Yeah. So whatever gets scared, spooked, there's a good possibility that there could be one in there. So if we do, if we do this ridge and then head on over the, to that yeah, that's island. That's what I would I would do. Yeah. Now let's check up under these rocks right here. Let's see if there's anything. Here. Now it's so hot. The only place they're going to be is somewhere in the shade. Nothing here. Uh, let's check. Oh, massive ant's nest. What's your hands? No, nope, nothing. No sign of pythons near these fields today. Apparently, during Hurricane Andrew, a medical research facility was also demolished by the storm. And that pocket of forest over there is now populated by the monkeys that used to be in that research facility. So it's an absolute mess. Where you find infected lab monkeys, there might be pythons. I can't wait to get over to that ominous looking island of trees. Here, we're hoping to find the kind of big snakes described by field workers. Now, we have the added possibility of finding diseased monkeys said to inhabit this miniature jungle. Check some of the greener areas. midday it's already been it's, it's already hot the pythons now need going into this thick vegetation where it's nice and cool like uh, hide up under you know the reeds root systems where it's nice and cool as we've seen they can just disappear into absolute nothingness they're amazing masters of stealth our senses are on full alert as we penetrate this dense habitat. Could a big python be in here? You've got a really, really freshly shed skin. You can tell it's fresh because it's still really soft, pliable, and even almost feels moist in places. You've got all the way from the head, pretty much the most perfect shed I've ever seen. It's got all of the scales on the mouth and head. It's even got the eyes. It's the eyes, everything is intact. 
and it was crawling up this up way. That way, and then it would have headed on. We do know a good sized python is in this jungle, but he could be up in the trees or slipped into any of the large crevices beneath our feet. As for the monkeys, well, we did find some suspicious monkey scat. It could be wild pig, but possibly belongs to a primate. I'd expect monkey to be slightly more liquid. Sometimes a bit of fruit skin, but could be. Um, mystery scat. Next, Reuben gets a call from another Python Hunter team member, Jason, about recent sightings at a restaurant. You've heard the rumours about a very big python living here, either underneath the restaurant or somewhere around this lake, and coming in and eating the ducks and eating the goats. A month ago, uh, a waitress that works here spotted a python going towards actually this building here, but there hasn't been any uh, actual like photographs or any actual proof that it has been coming here and eating and then going back under this, this building here itself. But we know that there are massive snakes very nearby. So a few months ago, Jason caught the largest snake that's been officially recorded in, well, in Florida. State of Florida, correct. In the state of Florida, just about a mile that way. Correct. Jason leads the way to the location where he went one-on-one -on -one with a huge python. Have you ever seen any other snakes, or that only this time? That was the only time I've seen a snake here. Look at this. So when you saw the snake and you approached it, what happened then? First thing I did, open his mouth. It just grabbed him by the neck. I had to pull him out this way. He wasn't coming out, and so I basically just sat on him. But he's fucking getting loose. He started wrapping around me within less than a minute. Had two or three wraps around me. The thing I was definitely scared of, him biting me the most, just because I already knew if he got onto me, I'm gonna need stitches, I'm going to the hospital, bad infection. Amazing stuff, amazing story. Yeah, cheers, man. Thank you. Clearly, despite the big freeze of 2010, huge snakes are still out there. Next, I enter a post-apocalyptic scene, come up with Python Gold. Python is great. I'm on the final leg of my investigation into Florida's pythons. That is a python. Yeah, yeah. And so far, impressed by the sheer numbers of them in a wide range of locations here in Florida. But the mystery of just how they got here remains. Tonight, Ruben suggested a largely abandoned cement factory. We've come to another location to look for pythons, this one post-apocalyptic setting. There's our factory behind us with all the cooling towers. We're on a dirt road. We're heading into the beautiful full moon. Python. That python in the road? Python. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I see. There we go. Excellent. Just amazing to see it on, on the road like that. Come on, little thing, you twisted yourself. And this is what they do. They have this amazing ability to wrap themselves up in knots and then try and pull their head through the knot they're making. But it's doing a good job of tying itself up. And I always try and control the head because that's the bit with the sharp parts. <laughs> it's actually co coiled itself somehow through the button in my shirt. Do you mind just undoing that button? <laughs> they always look for leverage and the tail is what provides it. There we go. So I'll just unwind it and they've got such immense power because it's just a column of muscle all the way down. They've got incredible strength. I'll try and process this now as quickly as we can just to minimize the stress to it. It's five feet, seven inches. In it goes. Right. But this is crazy. We literally just put the other one in the bag and George had gone off for a walk just to spot other snakes, and he's called us this second. Ooh, it's, it's coiled, it knows we're here. It's ready to strike. <laughs> That's a bit of a fight, this one was ready. 
Fantastic work, George. <laughs> Two minutes after putting the other one in the bag, and George came through on the radio. Oh, it's now it's clicking the buttons on my watch. And feisty, it was ready to go. Yeah, that one would have got. Yeah, finished. this one, this one would have got me. <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> <laughs> this place is obviously seriously, seriously good for snakes. Yeah, all around here, there's, there's all, all really? kind of. Yeah, it really is having a go. Oh, there you go. Dear, oh dear. We'll have to tire it out a little bit more before it's easy to measure. Too slow, man. There we go. Mm. Five feet, nine inches. Five feet, nine? Yeah. The other one's going to get bit here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that is a seriously, seriously feisty animal. Well Did it. Yeah, well done. I'm back at Joe's snake compound, searching for answers about the origin of the python invasion. And unlike most press reports, there's a bigger story here than just escaped pets. My theory is kind of a combination of everybody else's theory. People do buy small pythons as pets, and they get big, they get old, people, they don't want the snake anymore, the zoos won't take it, so people release them. So the other part of my theory is uh, there was an importer in an area very near Everglades National Park. And in 92, Hurricane Andrew blew through South Florida. And it went right through that importer who happened to have 900 Burmese pythons and they were blown straight into the Everglades. And if you think about it, let's say 50 females survived. And in three years, they're mature, they can breed. Let's just even say 10 hatchlings. Bottom end. So that's 500 the first three years and then if you look every three years, there will be a spike, a logarithmic spike. It would actually be quite easy to trace the origin of that first outburst it, using genetics. You could see whether it did indeed come from that importer. Or yes, whether. the animals that are being captured now are, are traced back to the importer. When I came to the Florida Everglades, I expected to find pythons. But what I was shocked to find was that the Everglades world famous for their abundance of wildlife, seem almost empty. All of the mammals that should be here appear to have vanished. And because of that, the pythons, whose numbers are still exploding, are now leaving the swamps and entering suburbia. The introduction of pythons to Florida, as with the introduction of any invasive species, from cane toads to feral hogs, was an ecological disaster of our own making. But it's only now that the pythons are coming onto our farms and into our homes and growing to the types of sizes where attacks on household pets and on people are a very real possibility. That the local people here are only beginning to understand the scale of the problem. In other words, once again, we have messed with nature. And once again, nature is biting back. There's a gorilla at large. He's in the aisles, in the balcony. He's everywhere. Get out of his way before it's too late. Misunderstood from the start, labeled as monsters of the forest by early explorers and later Hollywood movies, these largest of the apes are today facing extinction. Deep in the African jungle, this close human relative is clinging to life. Only a few hundred mountain gorillas are surviving in small patches of rainforest that line the volcanic mountains of Rwanda, Congo and Uganda. I'm in Uganda, trekking through the mountainous jungle terrain alongside the gorilla doctors, who are on a medical mission to save these last great apes. We surprised a female as she was coming out from feeding, and she just gave us a warning. As a biologist, I travel the world through some of the toughest terrain, researching animals to better understand their behavior. Now I'm on a mission to find the biggest and baddest creatures on the planet. I'm Niall McCann, and I'm here on the border between Uganda and the Congo in search of one of the most iconic species on Earth, the mountain gorilla. For centuries, these Central African jungles have been slow to reveal their secrets, concealing mystery animals known only to local people. 
mountain gorillas are a unique subspecies of the gorilla genus. Living at high elevation, their thick fur protects them against cool temperatures and the steady rain that falls onto the mountain slopes. Gorilla troops usually contain one mature male, the silverback, who can weigh 220 kilograms and stand six feet or close to two meters high. He protects the females and young from predators and other males seeking his mates. Protective charges by silverbacks can be frightening and potentially dangerous. But the work of researcher Diane Fossey in the 1970s allowed us to more fully understand these complex social primates. Ever since their sensational discovery in the mid 1800s, gorillas have been portrayed as savage and ferocious beasts, culminating in the film King Kong. And the persecution continued unabated as we hunted them for trophies and we kidnapped them for the pet trade and for zoos. And now, in the jungles of Central Africa, little more than 800 mountain gorillas cling to survival in what remains of their habitat. But some people are trying to make a difference. And I've come to Uganda to join the Gorilla Doctors, a team of veterinarians dedicated to securing the future of this most magnificent of animals, the mountain gorilla. I start my journey down the rural roads leading from Uganda's capital, Kampala, heading west towards the Rwandan border to the rainforest that is the domain of the mountain gorilla. I'm on my way to the brilliantly named Bwindi Impenetrable National Park in Uganda. One of my favorite things about driving through all of these villages is that I'm constantly smiling. Everywhere you go, someone wants to say hello. <laughs> the warmest welcome anywhere on earth. Fantastic. Then I spot something bright green moving across the road. This is amazing. Come on, little guy. I've probably made it quite clear that I'm a fan of reptiles in general and it's impossible not to love chameleons. This is a Johnston's, or three-horned chameleon, unique to Africa. You can see it's relaxed at the moment, he's just staying nice and green. When they get angry, they change color, they go a much darker color to express their displeasure. But I'm just being a part of his environment, I'm not grabbing him, I'm simply letting him walk on me. So he's feeling pretty casual. Fantastic, we'll let him go. And off he goes, what a colour. Absolutely wonderful colour. The reason they do that rocking motion is as camouflage, so it looks more like a leaf or a branch just rocking, much less likely to be seen by a predator. The road travels through farming areas, rich with volcanic soil. As magnificent as this land is, I'm reminded that the spread of people and agriculture is also impacting the gorillas. One of the biggest problems facing the mountain gorillas in the two places where they still survive is the fact that the national parks where they remain are essentially islands of forest surrounded by people and agriculture. Nowhere is this more stark than right here. If you look behind me, you can see the line of forest as it extends from down there, going up the mountain and over the top. On that side is forests and gorillas, and on this side, it's just agriculture and many, many people. I've got several more hours to go on this very mountainous jungle road. Meeting oncoming traffic here is always a challenge. Hello. The land is surrounded by tea plantations, an industry started by the British in the early 20th century. They called Uganda the Pearl of Africa. I meet up with Dr. Jan Raymer, a 
and the other guerrilla doctors at the inn where Diane Fossey stayed during her escape from a war in the Congo in the 1960s. Joining Dr. Raymer is communications officer Jessica Burbridge and regional vet Fred Nazi Yamana. So in 1985, right before Diane Fossey died, she was seeing gorillas, um, you know, dying in snares and from human-induced trauma. And she said there needs to be a veterinarian there. Just a couple of months after, in 1986, the first gorilla doctor came over. His name was Jim Foster. And he set up a little clinic. And since then, you know, it's been almost 30 years, and it's grown into an international team of vets. There's 14 vets that are working in the three countries. It's the greatest thing. It's the greatest thing ever. I mean, that's why we're here, is to help these animals. And when we can do an intervention and save a life, it's the greatest feeling. It really is. After my veterinary school, I always felt I needed to do something positive towards gorilla conservation. First up is a health check on a gorilla troop several hours away in Rushaga where people have been living side by side with gorillas for decades. So they'll, they'll go and find another group and they'll raid and they'll capture a female. Today I'm trekking with local guide David and Dr. Fred. It's a climb of more than 1,000 meters through communal farmland and into the domain of the Rushaga gorilla group. To locate them, we must depend on up-to-date information provided by an advanced group of trackers. So when we get to the top of the hill, the, the trackers will be able to hear us much better. Yeah, I didn't quite understand yes. all of that. I have just <laughs> talked with the trackers. We have always got trackers, they go very early in the morning to locate these animals from the point where we left them the day before. And how are they getting on? But as I talked with them now, they said they are still following yesterday's trucks and they are getting close to where they expect them to have nested. Okay. Yes. So then from there, we'll find out what direction they've gone today. Yes. This is sensational. We leave the last of the farmland behind and head towards the deep jungle. This jungle is one of the most spectacular I've ever seen. And I've spent a long time in the jungles of Central and South America and Southeast Asia and Australasia. And yet, I can say that nothing surpasses this. Then, right at the border of the National Park, a group of gold miners eke out an existence. Do they have an amalgam like mercury or is it all just, just panned? No, I think it's fine. Mercury would be a bad thing. While this is small scale, other oil and mining projects are threatening the delicate rainforest ecosystems of Central Africa. It's been a pretty amazing walk in so far. They're not called mountain gorillas without reason. We've been climbing and descending, climbing and descending and traversing across incredibly steep terrain, which is the last places where these gorillas survive, really. Anywhere in the lower lands are just filled with agricultural people. And of course, where people and animals coexist, animals tend to lose out. So what David was just saying was that we were going to have to climb that hill because that's where the gorillas were this morning. But the trackers have reported that they're starting to come down the hill towards this valley. This salad bowl is filled with amazing food for them. Briefly, the point where we are is going to be our preparation point. In case of anything like charging, running is not the best option. You are all advisable to stay and feel submissive. So you are advisable to stay still. Early explorers did not heed this warning and were terrified when silverbacks defending their troops charged them, even bending rifle barrels in half, adding to the monster myth. Finally, the gorillas have been located in dense vegetation on a very steep slope. I'm 2,000 meters up a mountainside in Uganda, and we've just reached a group of gorillas that need to be inspected for illness or injuries by the gorilla doctors. That one's, that one's nearly 60 feet in the canopy, indicates it's got to be well, it's got to yes. be in a healthy state. Yes, it is. 
uh, we can even appreciate it from a distance. Yeah. You look at the size of the stomach. Yeah, it's distended. Yes, the movement of the limbs. So we have one just here as well. And again, first thing you notice is the bloated nature of the belly. Gorillas being obligate herbivores have to eat just a vast amount of food every day, up to 20 kilos. And there's a lot of fermentation going on inside there. <laughs> <laughs> Hence, there's often a little sound in the background, a little trump. With all the females around, we know the big silverback must be nearby. The silverback is there. And he's absolutely enormous. This one is known for being a very successful predator on other groups. So he will raid other groups and steal their females. But he will raid by himself, even if the other group has three males. He's big, he's very strong, and he's got incredible bravado. A month ago, he stole a new female. So his group is now up to nine, and he looks very well indeed. <gasps> wow. <laughs> that was an amazing sound. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Just uh, let the members uh, know that I'm around. OK. All is fine. Yeah. <clears throat> He's on the move. He's just strolled forwards. The reason we're keeping this distance is because we carry all kinds of diseases, even when we don't realize it. The types of diseases that gorillas are simply not capable of defending themselves against. They just don't have the immune system for our diseases. So this is why it is enforced to try and stay about seven meters away from them to minimize the chance of us either catching a disease from them or giving a disease to them. Where this becomes much more complicated is when gorillas come into contact with agricultural people around here. Then we have a real situation whereby agricultural animals, domestic animals, can transmit diseases to and from the gorillas. This is peace to find, it really is. They have been vilified for all time, persecuted, almost to the point of extinction. Now, just a tiny population left. The work of the gorilla doctors of Fred, Jan, and the rest of the team is absolutely critical in ensuring the survival of one of our closest relatives, one of the most iconic species on Earth. The way we have treated them through history is abhorrent, diabolical. And I'm so glad that now there is sufficient incentive to change, to repair some of the damage we did, to try and guarantee their survival. It's very healthy. They are feeding Lomare. The big berries, they are feeding enough. That sound, there is a all. They are comfortable. They are getting it all. They don't feel threatened by our presence. I have to be careful not to get too close to the baby. The silverback is just a few meters away and could charge. There's a baby gorilla just behind me and the silverback just down there. Silverbacks and all the other gorillas in the family will defend the babies with their lives. So when European zoos and other people have come in to try and steal baby gorillas to sell to the pet trade or to sell into zoos, almost the whole family has had to be slaughtered because they will defend them with their lives. It belongs here and not in someone's home and not in a zoo. Finally, I hope we're learning, learning that gorillas belong in the wild. Next day, I head out to visit some nearby villages who have a long history of living next to and among gorillas. 
In the past, some encounters with local farmers and hunters did not end well for the gorillas. And I wanted to find out if attitudes are changing since the creation of the park in the early 1990s. For the young, gorilla ecotourism brings money. This elder remembers when his people had a different view. And when they met the gorillas, was it always a friendly interaction? That uh, when they met them in the forest, they used to think that they, had, they used to pass in the forest and uh, they used to give them distance, not going to cross them. So, so they used to think it was a lost person the in the forest. In the forest. Is it bad luck to meet? Bad luck. They thought it was bad luck to meet bad a gorilla. Luck, yeah. These dances, put on for tourists visiting the gorillas, help the community by providing funds for the care and schooling of village orphans. Absolutely outstanding. They've obviously really just adopted the spirit of the gorillas into their community. The kids have a wildlife club where they learn about gorillas, and here they are dancing the gorilla dance. It's just some, somehow become this figure of, I don't know, collectiveness within the community, whereas they used to be seen obviously as a fearful figure, a figure of some, some form of bad luck. When they went into the forest, if they saw them, they would be terrified, whereas now clearly that's not the case. Clearly they revel in the fact that they have these incredible animals right here on their doorstep. Our next gorilla encounter proves to be much closer to home. And fresh wounds on a male tell us a marauding silverback is on the loose. Three there. Day two, and we're told the gorillas are on the move and close to the communities. Dr. Fred, Dr. Jan and Jessica join me to locate the wandering gorilla troop. There we are, shaking a tree just there. Just at um, 10 o'clock. Spotted one shaking a tree there, 10 yards from a hut. It's insanity. Like, there's the national park. But all of this stuff, the secondary growth, is so rich in nutrients, so tasty. Jan's just described it as a gorilla salad bowl. Very good description. There's a gorilla, amazingly, right here. But as Jan said, it's eating bamboo, which has been planted by people. One of the things they're trying to do with local communities is to encourage them to plant the types of plants that gorillas simply don't like in the buffer zone. All right, here we are with the blackback karembezi. At the moment, he's uh, comfortably feeding. One good thing to note, as a habituated gorilla, he's already aware of our presence, but he's not disturbed. He's behaving normally, and that's what we like to see. Well, here is a perfect example of the problem we're facing. He's a gorilla strolling along a man-made path and uh, helping himself to the plants that people have planted. You can't blame the gorillas, they're here to get some good food, they're here to get nourishment, and there's fantastic nourishment in these plants here. It's just, it just brings them into conflict with people. And one of the big problems is that people carry diseases that gorillas are, I suppose, physiologically naive to, medically naive to. They haven't come across the types of viruses that we carry. On our data sheet, we record everything that we can. So if we don't see locomotion, we record saw everything else, but we didn't see locomotion. And then that goes into a computer program, spits out a report at the end of the month, which helps us understand disease, uh, injury, and the progression of that in these yeah. animals. Wow, there's a baby. Awesome. There's a little gorilla baby, which is absolutely amazing. And massively fat stomach, hugely distended. Gorillas are herbivores. You wouldn't imagine it from pictures of gorillas you see with massive great canines and looking incredibly aggressive, but they're basically obligatory herbivores. They only really eat, eat vegetation. It's very difficult to get much nutrients out of a leaf or out of, out of a stem or something like that. So they just have to eat constantly. Uh, they eat up to 20 kilograms of vegetation a day. That's a huge, huge amount. It's, it's hard for a human being to eat a kilo of food a day. It's, I've tried, it's really difficult. Amazing comical looks on their faces. Yeah. It's having a smile. brilliant time. It's like love wrestling.
This is all obviously immensely fun for them, but it serves a really useful purpose as well. It prepares them for real battles when they're much older. When these young male baby gorillas are going to be fighting for their own groups. It's looked like a bit of playtime, and it is. But it's preparing them for life as an adult. Jan spots a large male blackback with a wound. See the scar on his back? Big wound. It's healed really well. It's apparently one week old. It must have been very sore when it happened. He's a blackback, sub-adult male. So every now and then he's just going to be beaten up by the big silverback. It's going to happen. Life is tough as a gorilla. This playtime is preparing them for a life of battling for their own group. And sometimes they get seriously injured. I just spoke to Jan. She said that, according to Fred, the silverback that attacked the blackback we've just seen, the one with a big scar, was the same silverback that attacked one of the groups up in the mountain. It was obviously a marauding lone silverback maybe trying to steal females to start his own group. It's just something they do, they come into existing groups. They beat everyone up and they try and steal females for themselves, set themselves up as a harem leader. Then behind us, I notice two sub-adult gorillas feeding. The female wants to get by us. She's cautious, as we are. Even though weighing half as much as a silverback, she's still many times stronger than a man. Reassuring gorilla feeding grunts are given. Then the male also decides to walk up to us. He's getting very close. So as the male walked past, just as he was about to go, gave a little nudge towards Fred, which, as Fred has just explained, was playful. If he was aggressive, you would have noticed it in his face and in his demeanor. It was just a little nudge just to say, hello, have a little look at this. And these gorillas actually identify people individually. They know the trackers who work with them every single day and they see the trackers as their friends. So when we are with the trackers, that means the gorillas are relaxed because they know that their friends are here. They know they're not under any form of threat whatsoever. <laughs> so what just happened there was we surprised a female as she was coming out from feeding. And we're very close. We're probably about six, seven meters away from her. And she just gave us a warning. You, you could hear it, you could see it on her face. That was a real warning, that wasn't playful, that was, you've overstepped the mark. It was our fault, we snuck up on her by accident. But what's remarkable that Jan has just pointed out, that the gorillas are walking around on an official walk as a part of one of the lodges here. We are on the river loop walk. People could be sitting having a pina colada in there, not knowing that there's a group of 15 gorillas 20 meters away from them. We always go around. We never enter the group. We trail the group or we go around the group. They're right in the lodge now. <coughs> to avoid a potential confrontation, I step back to give this blackback male some space. There's three there. <laughs> it's a blackback, it's a young male gorilla. One day he will be the leader of his own group. Probably already weighs about 120 kilos. Ridiculous. Look at the strength in his lats. He's very relaxed. He's casually feeding with his back to us. Amazing how calm they are. But they know we don't mean them any harm. We're here with the doctors, we're here with their trackers. 
and they associate very positively with those guys. Yeah, I think we can stop from here because the group is like going further and further into towards the people. There's a community just there. As well. Yeah, the community people. And they may even go beyond this bush to avoid risks of disease transmission and yeah. stress. So will the trackers now the encourage trackers. the gorillas to go back towards the forest? Yeah, sure. The trackers will begin now chasing them, pushing them back to their habitat, to the forest. Yeah. We have yeah. uh, trained the trackers on the best way to handle that of okay. pushing the gorillas back to the forest. Just passively, presumably. It's yeah. passive. It's, it's been an amazing experience, obviously. I've witnessed some of the things I never thought I'd have the privilege to see. But it's just been made all the more pertinent by the fact that we are here in a tourist lodge. There's a sign for a massage just down there, and a gorilla walks straight past it, and there's a tourist just wandered up there. It shows the real problem that's happening here. It's human-animal conflict, and the gorillas are the losers. Next, I get an ape's eye view of the park, and news of the marauding silverback comes in. He's injured another silverback, and the team springs into action. Back at the park, we're waiting for any emergency health reports from trackers in gorilla territory. And I'm gonna try and climb this tree to get a bit of a view over the park. It's one of the most remarkable national parks left in Africa, one of only two places where the mountain gorillas still survive. What better way to have a look at the park and view what remains of the gorilla's habitat than by getting high up into the canopy? Too high. Yeah! tree here and I could got a view over the valley on the far side so the proximity of these groups of gorillas which live all around me to those massive communities of people that live just over there is genuinely a concern and something that the gorilla doctors are really working hard to try and mitigate against now the gorillas in most parts of their habitat, like Rwanda and Congo, don't really climb trees. But here they seem to, for whatever reason. There must be good food up here or potentially protection against ground-based predators such as leopards. But being up here, it's an ape's eye view and also gives me an opportunity to really appreciate just the absolute wonders of Burundi Impenetrable National Park. Back at the lodge, it's day three of assessing the health of local mountain gorillas, when we receive word of an attack on a silverback. We can see if that one's available. I received a call from uh, the warden in charge of tourism. He just informed me about an injured silverback of Mobare Group. They can survive terrible lacerations with nothing, um, but we just need to go and see um, and, and assess. And suddenly, Fred receives his phone call and action stations, baby, <laughs> we're off. So, better go pack my stuff away. When I came to Uganda to meet the gorilla doctors, I knew about the work that they did. I knew that they performed medical interventions, but I never imagined that I would get to see one myself. And yet we have just received a phone call that a rogue, Silverback Gorilla has raided another group to try and steal some females and has attacked the resident Silverback who has suffered the types of injuries that certainly require an assessment and potentially even a medical intervention.
It's been many hours since the injured gorilla was seen, and so the trackers have to find the group again. This could take several hours of searching at an elevation of 2,000 meters. Buindi National Park is up to about 6,000 feet in height, which adds a bit of a different element to the work in here. It means it's not quite as hot as you would be lower down, but it also means that the atmosphere is slightly rarefied, so you have to work a little bit harder to get oxygen to your lungs. We met the rangers at eight o'clock this morning, and we have hiked from about 1,500 meters above sea level to about 2,000 meters above sea level now. But the trackers still haven't been able to find them. 14 hour farm. Eh, Dani, who the other truckers, they say that they were following a fresh trail and they say the group is like facing this side. Oh, so they're coming this and, direction? Uh, yeah. Based on the latest sightings, we continue our search to find the injured silverback across rugged mountains and then even higher. The gorillas don't just follow paths. The gorillas are going where they want to go. And the tracker's job is to locate where the gorillas spent the previous night. This is all flattened by gorillas, all of this. Sometimes the gorillas will move several kilometers in a day. So the trackers have an incredibly difficult job. It's the five minute call, so we'll see what's happening. They always sound incredibly excited. <laughs> So what we're having to do is follow this path as far as we possibly can, so then we have the shortest distance to wherever they are. And they'll be anywhere, they're gorillas, they do what they want. And this group of gorillas are not only wandering around feeding, but they're trying to evade a marauding other silverback or other group as well. So even harder to find than normal. I've been communicating to the truckers. They, they said we branch this way, and uh, I'm not picking them on uh, when they communicate. No, because we're down in a dip. Yeah, by mouth, but uh, they are saying when you get to the top of this, we shall use another way of communication. A whistle? Not using a radio, not using a phone but using the mouth okay. to get the right direction because the radio is off and on, off and on. Are they with but the... this is the trail. Are they with the gorillas now? They are with the gorillas. Yeah. Let's go, mate. Okay. <laughs> yeah. oh. They've come yeah, yeah. back around this way. So yeah, the gorillas went up that way and then they swung around. That's where they are now. And now we are bushwhacking. We're moving diagonally across a steep mountain slope covered in thick jungle vegetation. And we've lost radio contact with the trackers. There they are. We're getting close enough that we can now hear them within 150 meters. We've suddenly broken out of the dense canopy into this incredible caldera of no shrubs and tree ferns, ancient, ancient tree ferns, one of the oldest plants on earth. That's exactly where the gorillas are. They're down here, surrounded by just the absolute glory of the African jungle. This group of gorillas that was attacked is essentially yeah. fleeing from the marauding silverback that attacked them. And as a result, they are proving incredibly difficult to find. Just, up there. Look at this. Just one last push up this hill. We found the trackers and we hope the injured silverback and his group. The truckers are here. Exactly as we thought. So the 
trackers were tracking a wild group and just kept on going. And late in the afternoon, they realized, double back. And now, quarter past four in the afternoon, we finally caught up with them. These guys caught up with the gorillas. Impressive work. This is not uh, ordinary day tourist tracking. Our main focus is uh, on the injured silverback. We want to go in fast to do an initial assessment. After the assessment As Fred is briefing us, I notice a movement behind him. Come up. Incredibly, it's the injured silverback come to pay us a visit. I'm up a mountain in Uganda's Bawindi National Park with the gorilla doctors. When Kanyonyi, the injured silverback we've been looking for, suddenly appears. We move carefully and speak quietly, not to startle the 180 kilogram, 400 pound giant, and to get into position to photograph and assess his wounds. He's approached within a few meters of us and we don't want him to feel threatened and possibly charge. So the team makes reassuring gorilla feeding sounds to keep him calm. Right temple. Right temple. Right very deep. Immediately, right we spot some deep See wounds. Everyone close by maintains a submissive posture to keep the huge silverback calm. Dreamed of my entire life, 
and you see images of them being this fucking savage, domineering, violent beasts. He walked to us, lay down, and chewed on a leaf. That is a picture of peace. Their portrayal is completely unjust and must have contributed to their demise. Next, the doctors take their best shot. To treat a badly injured silverback, the vets prepare the dart system that will deliver the antibiotic. The Jans just charge the dart so that the antibiotics in the solution is right up the tip of the dart. So when it hits the gorilla, it's all going to go into him. It could get dicey. Of course. But hopefully he'll just run away. But you never know. <laughs> Brace yourself. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So he knows what the gun is. He doesn't like the gun, so we have to keep it hidden. And what will be, will be. Everybody knows that if he charges, you should stand your ground and try not to pee your pants. Notice. <laughs> <laughs> it's never happened before, but there's a first time for everything. <laughs> Dr. Fred charges the dart gun. A female gorilla watches nearby. Fred's just gonna check whether he's got a shot. The gorillas are just down there. It's the injured silverback. from a distance of about four or five metres, and the dart hit his back and just bounced straight out, which means the antibiotic will have just sprayed over his back, won't have gone into the muscle, which is where it needs to go in to have its effect. And he just turned around nonchalantly, shrugged his shoulders and strolled off. So Jan has just sent back to get the porters to bring down a replacement. Fred has another dart, but that has anti-inflammatory. And the important thing here is the antibiotic because of that necrotic wound on his wrist. But the silverback has moved deeper into the underbrush and we've got to find him to administer the medicine before sunset or risk being stuck in this mountainous jungle terrain after dark. They're just trying to locate him. He's close. The dart is kept hidden from view. Searching for the silverback, we come across a female who warns us about moving too far into her space. Then we find the silverback and he's relaxed. Time for Fred to take his shot. It's a perfect hit. It went in. So they've just retrieved the dart and the sleeve has come back so they know it's gone in, which means they know the antibiotics are in him, which means he's gonna be all right. From my research, and now from my experience here in Uganda, it's clear that gorilla life, much as human life, is fraught with the threat of intergroup violence. But that unlike humans, for gorillas, the violence stops there. And their treatment of us, despite the way that we have treated them throughout the generations, is of moderation and tolerance. But finally, the tide is turning, and groups such as the gorilla doctors can perform their life-saving work with the full support of the communities that surround the protected areas of Bwindi and the Virungas, where the last populations of mountain gorillas can still be found. And the work that they are doing is absolutely critical. They're saving a species, one gorilla at a time. Since my visit, Kanyoni the silverback recovered from his wounds and has expanded his family to 10 individuals.